Warning, this episode contains strong language. Hello and welcome to PauseCast, episode 7. It is July 12th, 2016. I am Jessica Alouette and I use she, her pronouns. And I'm Mark Henna and I use he, him. Episode 7. We're still doing this, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Seven's a nice number. It's a prime. I like prime numbers. It'll be a little while before we get the next one. 7 and 8 are both considered kind of lucky numbers as well, so I think we got a couple of good episodes Uh, coming up. Well... You didn't hear my rant about Lotto in the lunchroom today? No. (laughs) When you go talking about lucky. (laughs) (laughs) Tell, Tell me more. Oh, no. I just... Anything like lotto or gambling, or they were talking about casino games, and I was kind of making the point of there is no winning strategy. The whole point of these things is the house always wins. The you know it's one of those things where the only way to win is not to play, right? Yeah, and we're actually going to be talking about some kind of interesting luck-based stuff a little bit later in the show. Uh, we're going to be talking about. RNG in video games, or for those of you who don't know what that abbreviation means, that is the random number generator. You either curse it or you pray to it, or maybe both. RNG Jesus. <laughs> or, or you just like hate the desire sensor, which if you've played Monster Hunter, perhaps you're familiar with this. Uh, when I when I talk about the concept of the desire er, uh, the desire sensor i mean you think oh i really want this item i really want this item and then you never get it oh. now, you'd actually I, i'd never heard of this concept until you explained it to me earlier this week but i have experienced it so much like hunting with my flatmate he needs this particular rare item and he doesn't get it in like 12 of the same monster whereas i get four and i can't give them to him i don't need it <laughs> That's the sort of shit that happens. Why? Okay, here's a question for you. Why is there no trading system in Monster Hunter? There is, but only for items of low enough rarity. So you can basically only trade consumables. Wait, really? Yep, anything lower than rare four. That sucks. <laughs> uh, I can see why it's there as well, because otherwise you could just come in with an old character who's got like 50 of these things, because they don't just use them, and just pawn them off to a lower character and get them up. Way too fast. Yeah, I guess. I think it'd be harder to do right than... There's definitely some balancing things going on with that, but, you know, like, I don't know if I agree with that, but I understand it, you know? So, this week, um, Mark, Mm -hmm. what have you been playing before we get to our full discussion on RNG in video games? I've actually managed to do something which been leading up to and I, I don't manage to do this very often but i set myself a video game goal and i achieved it i beat the final g rank boss of monster hunter for you and here i was thinking here i was thinking oh mark finally finished final fantasy 10 no not yet that's my next still no, huh? goal um i still have that one to finish yes <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and that this time. are you are you planning to do that in the next couple of weeks with Monster Hunter well, Generations that's the thing, right? coming I kind out, of or? either have to do it before Saturday when Generations comes out, or a bit further down the line. I I don't know yet because it's one of those games where it's so heavy on the narrative, and I want to put myself in that narrative. I need to be in the right mindset on the night, so I don't want to just. Decided so I'm going to play it tonight and then get home and feel, oh, actually, I wouldn't be too into it. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. I, yeah. I, I definitely have that feeling with a bunch of games that I play. It's like, I've, I'll think about, oh, maybe I want to play this when I get home. Or, uh, oh, I'm really invested in this. And then I get home and it's like, uh, actually, no, that doesn't quite feel right. And I'm not ready for that. Yeah, that's exactly the feeling I'm talking about. So I've, as well as Monster, I've been playing... Uh, what I can feel like is a bit more of a casual arcade type game. I actually just sort of rediscovered that I own this. Um, when we were talking about monster design last episode, I looked through um, the list of games I own on the Humble Store, and I saw one of them that I'd forgotten about. I bought it in a bundle ages back. I started playing it again. It's a lot of fun. It's called Hammer Fight. And it's kind of this 2D arcade game where you use your mouse 
to control a flying machine with a weapon attached and you like move in circles and the weapon will swing out using a physics system to hit other flying machines and knock them out of the sky and it's actually a lot of fun i really enjoy it and i can just sort of sit down and spend half an hour playing it and like nothing matters i can just mess around in it and it's nice to have games like that awesome have you been playing anything else particularly noteworthy this week those are the only two games i've been playing i've picked up my um book i've been reading again as well i found out just the other day uh, while discussing it at work that i thought that i was on book nine out of 12 i'm actually on book nine out of 14 so i've got quite a bit further to go still before i'm finished on that and i've actually been doing something a lot that's non-games related this week myself what's that i've been watching a lot of house of cards now that's the one of the um netflix only ones it was kind of the um like flagship one right yeah it, it's one of those shows that netflix put forth and it like thinks it's kind of a big deal turns out with house of cards they're on the money right um that's a really fucking good show is it the kevin spacey one it is in fact the kevin spacey one okay i've not seen it i've only heard about it i think a lot of people know house of cards by name at this yeah. point but uh who oh boy i do not regret my Netflix subscription because of this. It's cool. r- it's a really really well done show. It's it's hard to watch. It's kind of raw okay. in terms of its subject matter, mm-hmm. but it is absolutely stunning what they've done. And it's I found out that it's done by the same director who did um, Gone Girl, Fight Club, uh, Seven, and a whole bunch of other very notable movies. Uh, his name is David Fincher. Okay. Um, and I, re- I really enjoyed Fight Club and Gone Girl. Yeah, so, Fight Club's the only one of those I've seen, but I'll agree with really liking it. Yeah. And that's actually also Anybody? led me to another game. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I've been so enthralled with Kevin Spacey's performance in House of Cards. Oh, is this Call of Duty? This He's is in Call, it, of, isn't he? Call of Duty Advanced Warfare, <laughs> uh, which okay. is the the second to most recent one right uh i've always i've always been kind of a fan of call of duty because it does a specific thing very very well and that is a fast-paced controlled action experience although you you say controlled isn't the essence of the multiplayer stuff that it's really known best for that it's not so controlled like it's playing against other people right i don't touch that Ah, so you so you just do the the single player campaign? I just do the I just do the story mode for the most part. Most of the time because I'm coming back to like old old ass Call of Duty. Right. And I'm just like, oh, nobody plays this anymore. Got it. I can definitely empathize with only doing the single player of Call of Duty. Like if I play a Call of Duty, that's what I'd do. Yeah, because it's like <laughs> again, it's this really, really fast paced, heavy action thing. It's heavily scripted. It's I mean, I guess it's almost entirely story for whatever quality that may be. Uh, it It is an interactive Michael Bay movie. And I enjoy the hell out of that every once in a while. It's not something that I'm always going to be playing or something that I'm going to invest a ton of time in, like the multiplayer, but... So yeah. is, is the one you're playing the one that had that, what looked like a really half-assed attempt of giving the player another way to interact with the world than their gun. I remember seeing screenshots of press X to show respects or something. <laughs> yeah, it, this this is that game that has press X to pay respects. And I get why that's done from a design standpoint. I can, it, I, I can, I certainly like the thinking about having other ways of interacting with the world than shooting it. But, um, it's, it's not even that. Like, no? let's, no, let's be honest. This is, it is a way to get a player to interact with a scene that you have set forth, but it is not interacting with the world, quote unquote. It is a button press to advance the narrative and keep the player feeling like they're in control. Right. I get why. Like I said, I get why this is done from a design st- from a design standpoint, and people definitely throw that press X to pay respects screenshot out of context a lot they're like oh this is what call of duty's become and i always i always find that really disingenuous because 
like, again, I, I get why this is done from a design standpoint. They're just trying to figure out a way to make the player interact with the scene they're creating. Is it a little bit goofy? Uh, yeah, I would say it's more than a little bit goofy. But so is Press X to Jason and Heavy Rain. Well, yeah, yeah. Right? It's a, it can be a hard thing to, to have meaningful interaction. It's a, it's a really hard thing to nail. So I definitely appreciate that they tried there, because Call of Duty is not a game that I think is really known for trying to give the player things to do that aren't killing people. Yeah, and it doesn't really make any bones about that either. Like, it's always been about, oh yeah, this is about, like, this This is a very high-tech shooting gallery. Mm. Call of Duty's never shied away from it being a high-tech shooting gallery. And it's built itself on that, and it's built itself very solidly on that. Like, we, I don't think anybody goes into a Call of Duty expecting a really, really deep narrative non-linear experience no not at all it's something that the standard has been put forth that yes this is this is a linear game you get what you pay for with that well oh no you know what i'm I'm getting what you pay for it sounds that's no that's not true it's a full price game but it's a very slick high production value linear shooting gallery in, in terms of it being a full price game, you said you are um, only playing it for the campaign, but Call of Duty is also kind of known for having quite short campaigns. How do you feel that that price matches up with the single player experience if that's all you touch? I don't give a shit. No? No, I, th- I think a lot of people do, and I think there's a point to which I respect that. Like, there's this idea that we should be able to get a ton of value out of a game for the money that we spend on it. And that's why a lot of people don't buy shorter narrative experiences like Firewatch or Gone Home, which cost twenty to thirty dollars. Although those are much less expensive than a um, typical AAA game, right? Which we're talking a hundred to hundred and twenty dollars. Yeah, in 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 New Zealand dollars, yeah, sure. That's right. but, sorry. Yeah, I always think in New Zealand dollars. <laughs> yeah. I th- I think we should make it clear that that is New Zealand dollars. Yeah. Uh, games point. are expensive here. If you do the math and convert it, it's roughly 60 US dollars still. Okay. So, um, but Firewatch and Gone Home are still, you know, fairly expensive by, quote, indie game uh, standards. Yeah. And they're two to three hour experiences. In fact, I think I've completed Gone Home in one. Right. And a okay. lot of a lot of people think that that's not getting their money's worth, and I would totally disagree. Because let's think about movies. How much do we pay to go see a movie in a theater? The answer here is about kind of too 20, much. <laughs> twenty to twenty five dollars to go Flash for too much a, in my books. But oh, absolutely. I see where you're going. For a movie ticket and popcorn, and that's a couple hours of entertainment, and that's that's fine. We do that because it's fun. And, like, these shorter campaigns really don't bug me because I still feel like I'm getting my money's worth and I'm getting a really well-produced experience from it, even if it is only 10 hours. It's still I think that's a good that point, I... um, just comparing it to other media that we pay for. And it's even more explicit in movies that you're paying for this much time. Like, you're going to see a two-hour movie. It lasts two hours. Yep. And then there's other things. Like, I think I've clocked up something like 270 hours on this Monster Hunter game I've just finished, it, I think it cost me either 60 or 80 bucks. Like, compare that to a movie. Or, or the book I'm reading. I'm not going to finish that in two hours. It probably costs 30 bucks. Yeah. Comparing it, comparing it to other media is kind of the only way that you can really go with that. Mm. Because if you just look at games and compare that, like, you have a really, really insular view of things. Because we pay just as much for an 80-hour game fallout 4 as we do for a 10 hour game call of duty or uncharted Mm. again kind of puts perspective on things when you compare it to other things like that as well doesn't it yeah whereas the perspective can be lost a bit if you're only comparing game to game yeah like if i'm comparing call of duty to (coughs) fallout 4 fallout 4 is an infinitely like that's so much more valuable and it's the same price why are these games the same price and you could get into that but you're ignoring every other 
medium and that feel like that that feels like it would be very ignorant to me so i've again we're we're getting a little sidetracked here but i'm i'm really enjoying my time with call of duty advanced warfare i have oh. i have the most recent one as well black ops 3 because i got it through uh, humble monthly uh, i could pay a little bit earlier and unlock the multiplayer pack and because of the steam sale you can unlock the full game for super, super cheap. So I did. Okay. You've been on a bit of a first-person shooter um, bender lately, haven't you? That's the wrong word for it. But, like, no, no, you've been playing I, I think that conveys Doom and, the idea. and Call of Duty, and I those are the only ones I can think of. But still, Doom, like... Doom has reinvigorated my interest in the first-person shooter. Okay. Because of how well it's done and how just like it's reminded me of how much fun those games can fucking be. So Call of Duty is measuring up well against it? They're completely, completely different experiences. I'm not going to compare Doom to a Call of Duty because it doesn't make sense. They are so they're so different in both execution and tone that making that comparison feels very hollow to me. Okay. But Doom has successfully reinvigorated my interest in the genre, which has been fading in recent years. And I think Fallout 4 has helped with that as well. Um, the other game that's. Oh, yeah, helped, I don't typically think of Fallout 4 as a first person shooter, but you're right. It, it really. It, like, Fallout 3 and 4 really became that. Fallout 4 more so, because they, they actually got some designers involved from the next game I'm going to mention which has also kind of helped reinvigorate my interest in the first-person shooter as a whole, Destiny. Fallout 4, in its development, actually, they poached a couple developers from Bungie who worked on the gunplay for Destiny, which is amazingly well done, to work on Fallout 4. And that's why that Hmm. gunplay ends up feeling so damn good. I didn't know that. Yeah. I I don't think it's... Super common knowledge. You have to you have to kind of have your ear to the ground on that one, right? But it's it's an interesting piece of knowledge, and it makes you think about how much better the shooting works in Fallout Four compared to uh, Fallout Three and New Vegas. So the, that's the main issue I find with um, the combat and really all Bethesda games, rather than just Fallout ones, is how um, everything becomes a giant bullet sponge eventually. That, that makes it difficult. And I think even when you've got great gunplay, if everything feels too bullet spongy, I was talking to my flatmate about this the other day, is why it's come to mind, it can make everything feel like a real grind, um, just particularly in the higher levels of play. Yeah. I think, that's a, I think that's a problem that a lot of games, like Fallout and Destiny and Borderlands as well, I'm going to include Bo- this. Yeah, Borderlands is a big one that he found that on as well. Whereas Call of Duty, for example, that doesn't have that at all, right? It's a twitch shooter, pretty much. Yeah, it's, you it's hit very someone in the head shooter. with a bullet, they're done. Yeah, in that I mean, game, right? it's usually a, it's usually a couple bullets. Okay. Depend like it's all depending on where you hit them and blah yeah, blah, yeah. blah 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 blah. But yeah, they are that's, sponges. That's the general idea. They're not sponges. They're very easy targets. <laughs> where Borderlands is more about these kind of big, slow-paced battles that take a lot, a lot of bullets. And that actually, it annoyed the fuck out of me when I was first playing Borderlands 2. Yeah. And I, like, it it started to feel like a grind because I was playing as uh, the Assassin class, so doing from long range, and it all started to blend together. Yeah, I had the same thing, actually. But when when I returned to Borderlands 2, just kind of on a whim, I chose another class that allowed me to be more aggressive and encourage that. Mm-hmm. And found that that style of play really works for playing Borderlands 2 solo. Right, okay. Playing co-op, totally could see how the Assassin class would be more fun. Or doing a melee build on the Assassin class could also be quite fun solo. But um, I played I played Mecromancer and I've played Gunzerker. And yeah, being being more aggressive and upfront is a way more fun to play Borderlands. Um, cool. So that's that's yeah. We we went hella off topic there. That happens. So we got a couple quick news items, lightning round to touch on. Um, first, if you are a Persona fan, and I kind of am, uh, you may be wondering where the hell are the European 
uh, release dates for Persona 5. North America's gotten them, why haven't we? Uh, it's because the publisher for Persona actually hasn't like been around in Europe. Um, Square Enix Europe broke off their ties with them about a year ago, and that left a lot of the Persona titles in flux. So, uh, now in comes Deep Silver, who have published um, the Saints Row series, Dead Island. They're, they're a very well-respected publisher, I would say. Uh, they've stepped in now to publish Persona in Europe. We don't have any dates quite yet, um, but there is the chance that the classic Persona 4 may be available on the PlayStation Store like it is in North America. There is obviously Persona 5 to consider. Uh, again, no dates yet, but that is now happening. Persona's future in Europe and beyond is now looking not as shaky. Uh, and Mark, you had a couple of pieces of news as well. Yeah, I did. I figure I may as well mention, although... I kind of talk about it a lot. Just to be explicit, I'm very excited about Monster Hunter Generations coming out for the 3DS this coming Saturday, which will be, what, the 16th? Wow, four days away. So excited. Um, <laughs> but there are a couple other bits as well. So I have mentioned Starbound on this show before. It's um, a game I really like. It's developed by Chucklefish, and it's been in early access for a few years now. It was announced something like five years ago, so it's been building and building for a long time they've been adding more content while it's been in early access it's quite a lot now and they're finally they're, they're, they're saying they're leaving orbit but what they mean is they're doing their 1.0 release on the 22nd of july so that's quite cool i'm gonna definitely have to pick it up again and and play through all the new content after that comes out and now do we do we know if that's coming to any other platforms at the moment or is it still a pc exclusive um let me quickly google that cut that don't, i'll cut this don't worry we'll edit it out in post um oh starbound is coming to xbox one okay and something about starbound on ps4 but that might not be it sorry i think i just saw a forum title rather than actual news thing okay so it is um, it is oh, definitely yeah, coming oh no sorry that's stardew valley damn it um <laughs> it, this is you know, i'll xbox one game preview it says i don't know what that is explicitly but it's say that's coming to that. I'll send you the link. Oh, that, that's probably the early access that Xbox is working on at the moment. Okay, maybe. Um, so it is, it is coming to Xbox? No word on a PS4 looks release? Looks like it. I, a quick Google didn't find word on that, but there may be some I've missed. I pay less attention to it since I don't own any current generation consoles anymore. Fair and enough. I really own Starbound on PC. But yes, 1.0... Um, release it's quite cool so they have basically finally added their story stuff um one thing i'm quite excited about that i didn't get in my last playthrough is their progression system originally it was just basically combat and exploration based but now they've got other ways of doing it like basically building a village getting people to come move in and doing quests for them and getting your all your advancement stuff through that instead of having to just go fight random monsters and aliens. So that's quite cool. I always like building games, and this seems to incentivize it really quite well. Like, um, depending on the stuff you put in buildings and make it out of different NPCs that fit that are supposed to come and appear, which is quite cool. Right. So that's coming in a couple of weeks. And the other one, which um, looks cool but I haven't touched yet, is XCOM 2's last DLC just dropped, which is called Shen's Last Gift and... Uh, the way it had been um, alluded to, like not quite previewed, but foreshadowed, was saying it would add a new class to the game. And it turns out there's not a new class that your existing soldiers can take on or anything. It's you now get robot soldiers, which kind of it mirrors um, their expansion for the first XCOM reboot, which gave you like basically androids. You put a person, take a person, cut their limbs off and put them in a robot suit. Yep. Um, now you've got full-on robots. It looks quite cool. It, originally, when I saw it, I was a little disappointed because it looked like there wasn't much customization. But I since watched a stream with a couple of developers, and it looks like there's actually a lot more than I thought. Still not as much as with the human soldiers, but more than I thought, and I'm more excited about it now. So I'll see that when I do my next XCOM 2 playthrough, which is probably going to be November, because every November, for whatever reason, I decide I really want to play XCOM. 
like that has happened since XCOM came out just every November without really realizing it. I've just gone and found myself playing through it and then sort of realized partway through, oh yeah, I'm playing it because it's November in the last few years. So yeah. I think I'll probably I might, see that I see might join one. you in playing XCOM 2 around that time. I picked cool. up a copy, but I haven't touched it yet. Oh, you found one really cheap or something, didn't you? Yeah, I found one really cheap at one of the uh, local game stores. So, nice. Hey. Yeah, I really enjoyed my first playthrough of it. Um, XCOM, I, I really like tactics games. I've played other ones like um, Final Fantasy Tactics Advance and Tactics Ogre, Knight of Lotus, um, which I think was on both on GBA. Um, and I really liked both of those. They were probably the first tactics games I played, really. Um, and Final Fantasy Tactics Advance has got this, what I think is a really nice thing, where you can accept um, low-level recruits that just sort of come on, and it keeps your average level low. So you can sort of use that to moderate how tough your enemies are. If they're mm. too easy, you just let go of a few of the low-level characters you're not using. If they're too hard, you just accept a bunch more. Um, and that was nice because it, it felt like you could just wander around forever doing fights, and it wasn't continually forcing it, things to get harder all the time. Whereas XCOM um, and XCOM 2 very much have that forced um, pro- progression is not the word I want to use. Escalation. Escalation. Yeah. And that I find a little more um, jarring, I guess, because sometimes I just want to like pop in and go v- do a tactics battle and not come out thinking, oh, next time things have to be harder necessarily. It's it's nice to know I can just keep going. But it, I, I feel it like... works with the plot and stuff as well, so I can totally see why they did it. I feel like part of that school of design comes from the real-time strategy genre where you do have to be constantly ramping up your power in order to survive. Yeah, maybe, but that's that's kind of turned me off RTS as well. I, I Honestly, I wish XCOM, and maybe the mods will do this. They've got a bunch of mods. They've got Steam Workshop support for XCOM 2, which is pretty cool. Maybe there is one that lets you really slow down the progression or, or like turn it off at a certain point or something, because I'd... I'd do that and just stuff around and not research any new things, perhaps, and just go around fighting things the same level. I'd, I'd find that fun. But, mm. yeah, I like tactics games, and I'm looking forward to seeing the new content because I haven't played any this or the last DLC with the um, alien boss characters that come into it. So that'll be fun when I get around to it. Now, on the topic of XCOM, let's yeah. go into our main discussion for the mm. week. Actually, this comes, up, this comes up in all of the tactics games I mentioned it's pretty common for them to... Oh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll let you introduce it before I go back to that, actually, shall I? All right. So our topic that we've decided to, you know, kind of... We'll we're going to do a deep dive. This is the first time we've done something like this on the show, I think, where we've kind of chosen one thing to do a really, really, really deep dive on. And this week I have chosen uh, to talk about random number generation because some interesting stuff has kind of come up with regards to that, I've, I've learned some stuff about um, Call of Duty's progression system in more recent games for multiplayer. Um, and it's it's got me thinking. Of, I've, I'm thinking a little bit about RNG, who's done it right, who's done it poorly, where it's used, all this kind of stuff. Um, I've been finding that really fascinating this week. So I think... To start off the discussion, there are kind of two types of RNG that I want to talk about this week. And RNG, again, if you missed it earlier in the show, uh, does stand for random number generation. And it just refers to this idea that based on a number, you get some reward or some event will occur. And those that's... Both of the things I want to talk about this week. I want to talk about rewards that are given out through random number generation and probability through random number generation. Uh, I think first, I kind of want to touch on probability. Uh, XCOM uses that a hell of a lot, eh? All tactics games do, really. So what you often see, and this includes XCOM, for example, if you're um, reading up a shot, you're aiming at an enemy, it'll come up on the side and say, you've got this percent chance to hit. And then in XCOM, for example, it'll break it down and say, oh, no, this is your weapon aim and this is because you've got a height advantage or whatever. And then 
yeah, so it'll say you've got, say, 60% chance to hit, and then either you will or you won't. XCOM games actually are a bit interesting here, and perhaps different to other games, in that they don't, uh, or rather, they use a pre-generated seed. So a seed is a number that you pass into a random number generator, and depending on what you pass in, you'll have a one-to-one with the number you get out. So if I pass in the same seed twice, with most generators, I'll get the same thing back. That's very roughly what it is. But what it means for the sake of XCOM is if I fire a shot, if I save, and then I fire a shot and I miss, and then I load, if I fire that shot again, I'll definitely miss again because it doesn't get sort of redone. Yeah, Whereas but you if might, you, for if... example, pass in the timestamp to make it not the same. I think there's actually an option in the long war um, options to, to allow religion. save scumming so that, so that it doesn't keep it that way. Whereas yeah, most I think... games will have that different. I think that that is actually just in the standard stuff, like totally unmodded in XCOM Enemy Unknown. Yeah, it is. You it's, can um, you can choose to have a origi- random seed generated. It wasn't originally, time. but they added the long war stuff later on. Mm. Why why do you say it's the long war stuff? Oh, that's just what they call it. I think that's a reference to the original XCOM in some way. I, I'm not entirely well, in on no, the reference. I mean, it's base game. Long war is a mod. Oh, there is a mod called Long War, which is, again, a reference to the same original XCOM thing. Yeah. But these Long War options, I'm pretty sure that's what they're called, um, are in the base XCOM game as well. I think they came with the expansion. Mm, I think, so they're, just ca- the I think they're just called the advanced options. Maybe yeah. you're right. Maybe I'm getting the name wrong. I, I think, think they were called the I advanced I think that seems ones. likely. Um, but, yeah, that... I think most games do actually use that seed system where at the beginning of the level a random seed will be generated and that determines basically everything because I've definitely seen cases in Fire Emblem and XCOM alike where uh, I have I made a stupid move or I missed a critical shot and I was like, oh, reload mm-hmm. my save. I did the exact same actions with a couple characters. Yeah. And... Those actions again were like successful. I got a hit both times, or I missed both times, or whatever. And then, as soon as I moved one square differently, it was a whole different result. Yeah, yeah. So, typically, with the ones that don't regenerate the seed based on the time or whatever, it'll be based on your actions, it'll, it'll change the seeds. If you do things differently, different things will happen. Oh, I, do I don't, thing, no, I don't, I don't different. think it's the actions. Like, the actions themselves changing the seed. I think it is just the actions themselves are changing because the seed for the generation is no longer receiving the same values, I guess. Okay, I just checked, by the way, and you're right, they're called the advanced options. All right. I thought I thought, I thought so, because I, ha- yep. I haven't got the long war installed. Yeah, um, no, I was just misremembering that. Okay. I actually remember playing um, the original Golden Sun game. Oh, and man. Oh, so good. On Game Boy Advance. If you haven't played Golden Sun, you should go and find a copy of Golden Sun. And, uh, yeah. the, and then play pretty, Golden Sun 2 as well. Pretty easy to find an emulated copy of that, I would say. Oh, yeah, Golden, Sun, Golden Sun, in brief, it's a really, really cool Japanese RPG series uh, developed by Nintendo. Uh, one of the most interesting things that it does this is kind of spoilers but not really i guess the Uh, second the second game lets you play as the antagonists in the first game and offers a whole new perspective on things through that it's very cool if i remember correctly i think it takes about 24 hours for both games to get it that sounds about right. I think it might be 24 hours for each individual game. The second game, I'm pretty sure, was longer. But the the thing I was going to bring up, I remember finding out that in the in Golden Sun, there was um, it had that same thing where the seed for the random number generator depended on what you did. It didn't depend, for example, also on the time. So if you did the same thing, for example, uh, there was a room you could enter, and then I think you go down and walk right. You all start a fight at the same point. It'll have the same enemies each time. And if you do this particular thing, the random number generator will make it so that you get some really nice loot out of it. Mm. And you can then like go back out, save, load, and do the same thing again, get the same nice loot, and keep doing it and keep doing it, and sell the loot for lots of money. You could manipulate the RNG. <laughs> you could. You could. That's just because it was based on something that you had control over, whereas a lot of games don't have that, right? Right. 
and a lot of games a lot of games offer rewards through random generation. Not even just necessarily random number generation, but just random generation. Um any RPG does it? Yeah. Your loot for the most part unless it's real real special is randomly generated. Um Fallout 4 offers the legendary enemies which all drop a random piece of loot. Um Borderlands 2 all the guns are randomly generated, and all their stats as well. So even if you find a gun that's like the same model and same paint job, those stats are going to be different, and that could be it could be a huge difference between the two. And I've, I I find that really really interesting. And randomly randomly generated loot is always kind of it's it's tricky to pull off properly, but. Um, I, th- I think Borderlands is one of the better examples of that because it's randomly generating stats for all these weapons and randomly generating all that. Uh, and it's it's still got a level cap going on it, though. It can't generate something that's ridiculously over- or underpowered. So it's always, it's always generating something that f- is appropriate to you, but it is never really exceeding those limits and making it easy to break that game through random number generation. And I think that's also that sort of system is also beneficial for something like Call of Duty. Uh, I recently learned that Call of Duty Black Ops Three has supply drops for weapon unlocks now, so they randomly unlock for you. And I think that's far more beneficial than in the past. There's been a skill cap on uh, your weapon, so you have to get to a certain level before you can unlock a given weapon. And I, I, I've always felt like that's kind of a dumb system. I don't think that that's quite as accessible as just like randomly generating something, even though it can, be, like, I, I totally know that it can be frustrating when you don't get the weapons that you want. But I think because of that random number generation, you're no longer capping off the best weapons until you're like level 50 or whatever. Now everyone's, it's fair game for everyone because you got to work with what you got. I think that encourages a lot more improvisation and I think it makes for a healthier, more balanced game. I think it can make for a lot of frustration as well. And I've had an experience that really had that. Um, I played quite a lot of the multiplayer in Mass Effect 3 and that had a random unlock system. And part of the thing that made this frustrating, for one, it was complete random, like you don't have any control over what unlocks and it didn't seem to have any um, relevance to what you did or what you were playing, it was, it was just a random thing. But also you could unlock the same thing multiple times. And for example, if I unlock the same gun a second time, it gives me level two of that gun, it's a little more powerful. But of course that means you can unlock a gun you don't use and you don't like 10 times before you get one that you do like. Particularly where I found this got frustrating is when they released new content and you didn't have access to it unless you unlocked it randomly. And I never did. I got the free DLC. It was good that it was free, but I never got to play as any of the new characters or anything like that because I never happened to unlock them. I was never lucky enough. So it can be really frustrating from that perspective as well to have entirely random unlock systems. And th- that's why we need to have some... Like, like, There needs to be a lot of careful consideration that goes into these systems. Yeah, in Mass Effect 3, you could, for example, pay real money, and I regret having done this, to unlock things faster, but it was still random. So you might pay like 20 bucks and lock a bunch of stuff and still not like it. I can see games that have got that sort of pay to progress a bit. I don't know if I'd be fully in favor of it here when you can actually get weapons more powerful as well, but in terms of just different characters, if you if they want to do a microtransaction system, I can see how there would at least be some sense, even if it's still very frustrating from a perspective, to have random unlocks, but then you can pay for particular ones, at least <laughs> in there is a way. Yeah. I'd, like, something... It's okay. Something's really bothering me about that Mass Effect 3 system. hmm The thing that's bothering me is this idea that you can unlock... Like, you randomly unlock a more powerful version of a weapon that you already have. I think that's terrible RNG. It was I think very that's, annoying, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's like, of all the ways that you could do random number generation in a multiplayer game, I think that is the worst possible fucking way you could have done that. Like, I think I had something like a level 7 shotgun, and I didn't use a shotgun. Good fucking job, Bioware. <laughs> um, 
let's be honest, Bioware is never good at their multiplayer. <laughs> It's unfortunate. I, I really enjoyed the gameplay of the Mass Effect 3 multiplayer, honestly. I really like cooperative multiplayer games, and this was a cooperative third-person shooter that okay. I really enjoyed. It was the unlock system was really the source of frustration for me. Yeah. I, I, again, I think that's fair, and I think that, that that unlock system is really, really dumb. We're unlocking, uh, like unlocking something that is, you know, base level randomly. If you get an improved version by using it a lot, I think yeah, that's see, that cool. would make more sense, right? And it's kind of like I, I think, in the Elder Scrolls games where your, your skills level up when you use them. Which and I'm like. pretty sure that's the system that Call of Duty has, where okay. you, you randomly unlock your weapons, and then as you use them, you get the ability to throw some attachments on there and whatever. You can trick yep. your gun out just a little bit more. And But that makes it so that if you are using something, you are actively progressing towards, A, getting new weapons all the time, Mm-hmm. And B, improving the stuff that you already have. So even if you don't get RNG for really, really good stuff, or just stuff that you really mesh with, you still have something in your arsenal that is effective for you. I, I, I think, again, this is a tricky balance to strike, and I think that uh, I have heard, I've heard that Call of Duty's fan base is very up in arms about this whole system. I think that's foolish. Um, but I, uh, on one hand, I can understand it. On the other, I think it's foolish. But I think, I think personally that they've struck a balance with this kind of system. What do you, what do you think about that sort of stuff? I, I'm having a hard time, I think, because I'm coming from this perspective where the, the most comparable thing I've played is that Mass Effect one, which I found really frustrating. Yeah. So I can I can see it I think more from that perspective. Having um sort of checks and balances, I guess, to make sure you're getting stuff that's relevant to you, that's good, that adds to it. Um I can still see benefits in the other system as well. This is actually reminding me a bit as well of um the loot system in Diablo 3, which is also kind of randomly generated loot, sort of like um you've bought up in Borderlands, except they've also got the unique stuff. But if I remember correctly, when the game first came out. The loot that dropped was proper random. Like it didn't matter what class you were playing. So you might be playing a class that relies very heavily on its intelligence, and you get a whole bunch of strength stuff that is completely useless to you. Yeah, I've, they, I've... they later changed that in the patch. So having been playing more recently, I've found, oh no, I'm getting stuff that has like increases skills that my class can actually use, rather than ones that are completely useless and I have to give to another character. I've seen that a little bit in Destiny, actually, because all yeah. of the yeah, all your weapon unlocks in there. What happens is you get you get an item that indicates like, oh, this is the tier of like gear that you've unlocked, mm-hmm. uh, and you go and decrypt it, and then it gives you a uh, it gives you a random weapon. Mm-hmm. It's, you basically you, it's just you turn them in, and you get you get your shit. It's basically an identification, like you've got in games like Path of Exile and Diablo. Yeah, I think I think that's right about the. I think that's the right comparison. Um, but I've definitely I've run into instances where I am playing one of the three classes, Mm -hmm. and I get random drops for. um, Let's say I'm playing a Titan, and I got a random drop for a Warlock or just something else. Am I so, remembering correctly that there's no trading system in Destiny? There is a trading system. Okay. Uh, there is also a way to just easily transfer stuff. You have a vault, so yep. you could if That's you get stuff. Game, yeah, if you if you get something that is um, not your class or whatever, you can throw it in your vault or just destroy it. Uh, destroying destroying stuff in Destiny gives you. Some currency and uh, depending on the tier of weapon, it'll give you some construction parts. It'll still feel like a letdown if you feel like you have to do that, though, right? Yeah, you feel really excited when you get this rare thing and you identify. And it's like, oh, great. So yeah, I I think I would be rather irritated if I got one of the legendary items and I decrypted it and oh, it's not for my class at yeah. all. And that's a it's a very rare occurrence, I will say. I have happened, had it happen to me a few times in Diablo, but once you're playing at quite a high difficulty, to be honest, you can get like seven of these so-called legendary items in one couple of hour play session. So it's not quite as big a letdown when you're getting a bunch. 
No, where Destiny's legendary drops or even their rare drops are just it's it's it is a rare or truly legend worthy <laughs> event when this happens. Like how legendary is legendary? Once every couple of nights? Legendary is once. If you are playing it consistently, once in a week. Okay. Like it, it's that it's so that's that exciting. kind of yeah, it's it's a pretty exciting deal. Yeah. There's um one tier higher than legendary, which is exotic. Um those don't those exotics never drop randomly. Okay. You have to actually like you have to spend um legend tokens on them. Hmm. Basically, it's I, I forget the terminology. It's been a while since sure. I booted up yeah. Destiny. I, I wouldn't recognize it anyway, having not played Destiny. Well, it, the idea is that you have a set of tokens that you can get for finding legendary items and stuff like that that you can, and for completing daily quests and stuff that you can put towards um, getting very rare weapons and armor. Right. The interesting thing about the exotics is that um, you can only wear one exotic armor and one exotic weapon at any time okay and you have you have three weapons and four armor slots so you have to really <laughs> choose what you want as your exotic so it makes for some it makes for some interesting choices but we're getting off topic this isn't rng mm. but um yeah i I'd, I'd be frustrated if i was decrypting high tier stuff and getting the wrong class or just like not getting anything that isn't as good or better than my existing stuff. I can see myself getting frustrated really easy. Most games that I play seem to have their shit balanced. So I always seem to be making a little bit of progress at a time. Yeah. And I th- um, yeah. Yeah. Here's a question well, for yeah. you. Here's yeah, a question yeah, yeah. for, for you. Do you think do you think skill caps are are they a beneficial system in most cases like throwing a, throwing a level cap behind an unlock or even just gear even just gear in RPGs like is having a level restriction valuable? I don't know if a skill cap is the right word for that, because really what I see it as is it's a time cap, right? You have to put this much time into a game before you get access to this content. Right. And I can sort of see pros and cons for that. Like, I mean, this is coming again from someone who's put dozens and dozens of hours into a game they just finished. And it feels really rewarding then when you do get access to the content, you go through it. Yeah. Um, So from that perspective, it might seem cheapening to take it away and just give it out no matter how much time you spend in the game. But it's also crap to play a game and feel like you're not going to get access to some content for whatever reason or another that's not, that doesn't feel like any fault of your own, if that makes sense. Okay. Like some people don't have a whole lot of time to put in games. And some games, yeah, you've got that sort of, you can pay for progression if you don't have the time to put in. Always feeling kind of of two minds about that as well. I think... there's There's a point to which it bothers me with multiplayer games... But with a single player game, I can understand that. Like it's it's been in the Assassin's Creed series a couple times that you could pay some real money and get boosts to yeah. allow you to progress more easily. There was ship boosts and all kinds of stuff in Assassin's Creed 4. And I I think that that is something that is valuable. They're generally think, things that I see as, oh, I'm sure this will be good for someone, but I, I, I'm too frugal, I'm too stingy, I don't want to spend money on something I've already bought. Yeah, like, it's, <laughs> it's, it's not even a matter of frugality for me. It's just like, oh, I don't mind putting the time into the game. Yeah, I think when those time caps can become, a, well, I was going to say a grind, but that really gives it away. I think when they become a problem is when you really have to grind, right? When the game no longer becomes fun to get to that point, then mm. you've got a problem. And I think that that in itself is its own discussion about like how much should a game quote respect your time. Mm. Um, this is something I, that turns me away from a lot of MMOs is that it always looks to me like if you don't put in a lot of time consistently, 
you'll get nowhere. And that's that honestly been my experience and what little of MMOs I have played as well. So it's really turned me off them. Yeah, I think that's a totally, like, I think that would be a fairly common experience even. I've even had that problem with single-player RPGs, like Bravely yeah, Default. I think that's more problematic when it happens in single player. I can understand, at least, even if I don't like it, I can understand why they put it in multiplayer games because just like how you have to pad out your in-game content, right? You're going to have players who put that much time in and you want to have stuff there from the, for them. The yeah. tough thing is is not taking that away from the other players. For single player games, I, I like that a lot less. It's nice when games have got stuff like a story mode difficulty or things like that for people who don't have a million hours to put through stuff. You know? Yeah, or just like generally don't have a high skill level like many video games demand. Like... Let's be honest, video games have a really, really high skill requirement to be able to play most of them. Or they like are just inaccessible to disabled players. It definitely varies from game to game. And it's really cool when we see um, developers put some effort into actually they actually think about how accessible their game is, particularly for disabled players. So you've got stuff like colorblind modes for people who are kind of blind you've you've told me about was it was it uncharted that had the so you don't have to tap the buttons it really was fast? and by the way i did finish that i finished uncharted 4 this week and oh yeah want to say first of all amazing game uh if you have a ps4 and you don't own uncharted 4 you're missing out <laughs> um but uncharted 4's accessibility options were really really valuable even to me like i hate I just I just hate the button mashing events. Mm. Mm-hmm. I can do them. I do them really good, but I don't like them. Yeah. Uh, and Uncharted 4's one toggle right at the beginning of the game even is just just to turn them all off and make them all just hold events made playing that game so much nicer, even though it was just a small detail. Yeah. Just another and, thing that bugs me about games. Just just a quick one while I remember. They should give you the option to turn subtitles on or off before they start. They do in Uncharted Four. Good, good, because it's it's part game, of like the accessibility options me. are shown to you front and center. That is if I really recall good. Correctly. That's really nice. Yeah, so it lets you it lets you turn on or off all of this really really valuable stuff. Cool. Um, I haven't touched the multiplayer on that, but I finished the story. It's really good. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, access, that's that's. It's Uncharted 4 is a really, really solid example of accessibility in games. And it's a, another solid example of a game that really respects your time. You can put a ton of time into your single-player Uncharted 4 and do a ton of exploring and just looking around, and it still feels just as rewarding as if you were to mainline it. I'm going to have to... I, I'm, I'm still hoping that my brother, who owns the PS4, is going to buy it so I can play through on his PS4. <laughs> um, well, you plan to get one eventually anyway. I, I'll lend you my copy of Uncharted 4 once you get it. Eventually. Here. I think once The Last Guardian comes out, I'll have to. That's October, I think. So that yeah. comes out. Okay. Q4 then. Maybe. We'll see. Yeah. Um, back Actually, to the top. Do, yeah, do we have just, much more about RNG? To thinking talk of that, that difficulty problem, RNG is sometimes, particularly I'm thinking of um, RPGs where the damage dealt to you and the enemies is um, partially determined by a random number generator. Man, mm. that, those can be really nasty <laughs> Sometimes Ooh, when you've got the, when you've got stuff like oh they score a critical hit on your character and they're dead. I I have had playing through Final Fantasy X um, some really frustrating times where it's been 15 minutes away from a save, like not a huge amount of time, but enough that it'll be a real grind to do that same 15 minutes immediately again. And I'll go into a random battle, which are common in RPGs, particularly ones that aren't like the new the newer Final Fantasies have shied away from them. There are some. Um, RPGs that are really good at not doing them, like Chrono Trigger, but it's pretty common, particularly in all RPGs. Random battle, and it'll be, oh, you've been ambushed. The enemies all get a turn first. And before I can do anything, all of my characters are killed. It's game over. All I did was take a step, and suddenly it seems to be back 15 minutes because of the random number generator. That can be a real frustration. That is infuriating. Yeah. That that would piss me off. 
I've I've had situations come up more often than not, I would say, in the Fire Emblem series of games, which I love. I truly, truly love... Um, I truly, truly love the um, Fire Emblem games. But goddamn, they're brutal. <laughs> um... <laughs> I've run in, I've run into situ- like I run into so many situations in those games whether it's through poor planning like placing one of my flying units near archers and holy shit um that is a bad idea that <laughs> <laughs> gets them killed very very quickly and that's just poor planning or I have really really bad RNG where it's like 50% to hit. I've got like two points of health more than the damage they're going to do if they hit. They get the hit. Or, God forbid, someone gets, like one of the boss characters gets a crit. And those characters are permanent. Like, they're if they die, they're done. That's it. There is no resurrecting them without sa- saves coming, which I do constantly in Fire <laughs> Uh, Holy I, I shit. Have, I um, have actually another area where I run into random numbers a lot where saves coming is not a thing. I run a Dungeons & Dragons game. We roll dice. It determines if you hit in combat and what damage is dealt in as well, if, if skill checks succeed and stuff like that. Random numbers are a huge part of lots of pen and paper games. Um, oh, yeah. The one I run is, is Pathfinder, but it's the same thing. You roll dice, you've got like dice with 20 sides, with 12 sides, with 8 sides, with 10 sides, with 6 sides, with 4 sides. You roll them all for different things. And particularly at lower levels, I, I run the game, so I'm like, I'll control the things they're fighting. I've nearly killed players because, oops, I rolled a critical hit, and they're only level 1, and there really isn't much wiggle room one way or the other. No. Random number generators can be really brutal. Luckily, I play behind the screen so I can fudge the numbers if I don't actually want to kill them, and they nearly did. <laughs> but don't tell them. No, I, I don't. Unless they listen, I don't think they uh, <laughs> will ever know. And th- that's kind of the beauty of being the GM, or the beauty yeah. of being a random number generator system. Well, it's hard in a game. You can't have really a person there to use their discretion to decide if the RNG just spat out something that's crap. Like, oh, you took a step, random battle, your entire party's annihilated, go back 15 minutes. Yeah. I mean, you can put you... some checks and balances in place, but it's hard Certainly, to Certainly, yeah. Sort of I was going to say, you could totally do some balancing there. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's tricky. It's tricky to actually strike that balance. And it's, uh, in most games, you're not going to have any forgiveness <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I possibly should have mentioned just on that Final Fantasy X note, I heal after every battle. I was at full health, so it wasn't like I just not healed. You No, you <laughs> you weren't like... I wasn't like on 10 health on every one. So no, you, you, it everything. wasn't the result of poor planning. It was no. the result of just bad RNG. Yeah. It happens. I'm just like... I'm, I've, I, I think I've always been fascinated by games which are dictated by RNG. Like like the Fire Emblem games, and the like, I've never really quite figured out how probability in those games really works. I've always wondered: is it like a binary? Is it? Well, how how do you mean? I mean, I mean, like, how does the game itself calculate the? How does it calculate probability? Is it calculating it as a one or a zero value? where it has a 95% chance to what, hit. What, I, I haven't written any games, but my experience with programming is essentially you will have some random number generating function. You pass in a seed, which might be pseudo-random itself, might not be. Um, and that function has got to have some probability distribution. So it might be uniform. There's an equal chance of every number. It might be a normal distribution where you've got a greater chance around the average which is more common, I, I think, and then like less around the outside, it's probably going to be discrete if it's damage-based. Right. Um, and then you might have some threshold if you're trying to turn it into a binary. So, uh, for example, if I'm writing code and I want an 80% chance of something, I'm going to generate a random number between 0 and 1 and then check if it's greater than 0.8, basically. Right. So you can, you can convert it into binary that way. But the probability distribution behind it will still matter. So you might 
um, instead of flipping a coin, you know, 50-50 chance of each, you might have an 80-20 or whatever. So that, so when it says, for example, you have a 60% chance to hit, what it's probably doing is just that random number between 0 and 1, is it greater than 0.6? Yeah. Well, no, sorry, is it less than 0.6 in that case if it's checking to hit? But, yeah, you, you know what I mean. Yeah, I, I get the idea. I, I've thought about that being a possible way for that to work too. What I've contemplated I, doing sometimes is <laughs> graphing out the like expected damage for certain things in D&D to see at what point should I use this skill that lowers my chance to hit and raises my damage. Like, what is, <laughs> If I've got this plus X to hit and they've got this armor class I have to beat, at what point does it become worth doing? I have higher expected damage and at what point do I have lower expected damage? But I haven't actually gone and done it yet. Right. Shit's so fucking interesting. Yeah, I like probability. It's fun. Statistics is fun. Probability. Uh, do you think that probability is one of those things that we learn in school that we think like, oh, we're never, ever going to use this. This is dumb. I hate this. <laughs> I mean, like algebra has that reputation, eh? I used to be a real ass about statistics when I was in school. I always be like, oh, it's like maths, but you're never quite perfectly right. I was a dick about it. No, statistics is really important, and I wish I paid more attention to it. And I try to learn more now that I'm out of school. But um, yeah, particularly because I've got in my hobby, I'll um, criticize bad science. And if I don't understand statistics, it's it's really hard to um, read research and understand it, right? When yeah. you've got things like confidence intervals and stuff like that, if you don't know what a p-value is, it's really hard to understand research. Uh, what is a p-value? So. Oh, do we have another hour? No. Um, so a p-value is, let me get this right. It is the probability that, wait, I, I don't want to get this backwards. Sorry. So fix all of my pauses and editing, please. I will. If I've got, um, what, what you typically look for, it, it, we've got this sort of really, it is honestly completely arbitrary. Um, threshold for what we call statistical significance, which is a p-value less than or equal to 0.05. Now, if you have a p-value of 0.05, what that means is there was a 5%, so it's 0.05 out of 1, 5% chance that the results you got um, could be explained by random chance. So it's basically, given you got these results, what's the chance that it's... It's bullshit. I lost my thread. No, it's not Not that it's bullshit. Just, <laughs> ah, I need an example to use. But then that's going to take us another 10 minutes. A p-value is basically... I just lost the thread I've got again. Give me 10 minutes to write something, I'll have it. But pulling it out... The p-value... Google, Google to the rescue... Yeah, the p-value is defined too... as the probability of obtaining a result equal to or more extreme than yeah, what was actually point. observed. Is that is that, is so that going to yeah, do it? Yeah, sorry, I was thinking of it in a specific context of hypothesis testing. Okay. When you're also thinking about the null hypothesis. But, like I said, if, if we've got like another half hour or something, we can get into this. Then we could, totally, we could go deep. from games. Yeah, we're not going to go quite that deep into RNG and probability, I don't think. I'm disappointed with myself for not pulling the definition of a p-value right out of my head. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, I mean, I don't expect you to have that kind of in RAM to, <laughs> to, to say, to use an analogy I think we both understand. I tell you that after this recording, I'm going to go and make sure that next time I will be able to pull it out of my head. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good times. All right, I think that now is the time that we ask, what are you looking forward to playing this week? And I think, can I, can I make a prediction for, yeah. you, for you this week? Yeah. Uh, Monster Hunter Generations. Yeah, from okay. Saturday. So yep. I've got like three nights of, uh, I'll probably read my book. But from Saturday, yeah, Monster Hunter. And maybe sleeping sometimes, I guess, if I have to. So remember, if our episode is late next week, you know why. <laughs> and if I seem distracted? <laughs> I know why.
Yeah. And if you don't show up on at work on Monday, <laughs> uh, I maybe know. I should book leave. No. <laughs> <laughs> Just you could probably book Monday leave. Oh, it's a, probably a bit late now. Uh, so yeah, you're you're absolutely right. Monster Hunter Generations is what I'm looking forward to playing to, uh, playing this week. What anything you? else that you're looking no, at? No, I or? I'm it's it squashed everything else out. I don't ex- I don't feel like I'm going to be in the mood to finishing Final Fantasy X before then. Unfortunately, oh. I'm still trying. I know I've lost momentum with it, but I'm still trying to keep that narrative in my head, sort of. If that makes sense, so I don't lose it. Yeah. Keep the you know the importance of the characters and whatnot. Um, so I'll still get to that, but I, I don't expect that's going to be this week. I think um, for myself this week, I'm going to be mm-hmm. focused on finishing Advanced Warfare, finishing uh, Assassin's Creed Unity. Uh, so that's something you've been playing through. Uh, you've been both watching a Kevin Spacey TV show and playing through a Kevin Spacey. Yeah, House of, House of Cards got me like super into Spacey's acting, and I was like, so, okay, yeah. So, um, which one? In which one is he more realistic? Define what you mean by realistic here. Convincing that he's a human, like that he's not CG. Does it like what I'm trying to ask is does Call of Duty like is it really clearly Kevin Spacey? Is it so clearly him that it could be a TV show or is it still clearly a video game? There is points at which it is still clearly a video game. Okay. And there is points in kind of the in-between cinematics, like the, all the cinematics that play in between the levels, those are rendered with some supreme quality, I would say, cool. because there is points at which I cannot tell if they used full motion video or if it is CG. That's good. Kevin there's Spacey. Some, the Kevin Spacey looks using... very much like Kevin Spacey. <laughs> I think the topic of using people's actual like face capture in that way, it's kind of another topic to talk about. I remember seeing um, Andy Serkis in, what was that game? Hev- Heavenly Sword mm-hmm. is the enemy there. And he was really recognizable. He was really good. And like just the way his face added to it. Um, Andy Serkis is really it. not known for showing his face though, huh? No, I guess he's not. But like, it didn't look like Gollum, but you could still recognize it. There's something about his his mouth, I think. I don't know. Mm. But yeah, yeah. I, I think I think that that's it's fascinating in and of itself. Like we've got Norman Reedus starring in the upcoming Death Stranding, which we still haven't figured out whatever the hell that is. Uh, apparently, it's an action game. That's oh, what okay. Koj- that's what Kojima has said. Well, you so. can tell from the trailer clearly. Oh yeah, it's yeah. <laughs> you play as Ghost Baby. <laughs> you play as the Ghost Baby with oil hands. Yep. Well, oil hands is his nickname, of course. <laughs> um. So you're looking forward to to yeah more Call of Duty. Well, yeah, more more, more of that. Finishing it off, it's short campaign. Um, mm-hmm. Assassin's Creed Unity probably going to continue to play a lot of doom i to say the least i'm not optimistic about finishing this week but i'm probably going to put some more time into it it is a game you're going to finish though you think oh absolutely there's okay. no way in hell that i'm not finishing it i think it's my <laughs> are you being visited by your cat again did you not hear him jump up on the desk no i didn't okay I think with uh, Mark's cat visit, it is now time to wrap up the show. Uh, We've got a little bit of housekeeping to attend to. First, uh, if you are on iTunes, hello. Thank you for listening to the show. Uh, Maybe consider throwing us a rating and a review. That would be nice. It helps us out with exposure tremendously. Any ratings and reviews that we can get for the show would be awesome. Um, if you're not sure. listening through iTunes, don't worry, we still like you. Yeah, and maybe go see if, <laughs> like, maybe see if you can go rate it and review it on iTunes as well. Um, I might try to get it up on Google Play as well. So uh, that might be another place you could go rate and review if you are entirely out of the Apple ecosystem. Uh, we are on Twitter. First of all, we are on Twitter individually. I'm at Cockatiel Cutie on Twitter. And I'm at Honest Universe. 
And you can find the show itself at Pausecast Show. You can find our... Oh. Oh, no, you, you continue. You continue. Okay. And we've got a theme with that. So you can email us at pausecastshow at gmail.com. And we've got a Facebook group as well, which is facebook.com slash groups slash Pausecast Show. Yep. Um, if you are listening on a platform that isn't iTunes and you'd like to find us on iTunes, that's cool. Uh, you can go to bit.ly slash podcast dash iTunes, and that will bring you straight there. That's all lowercase, no caps or anything. Uh, is that it for... No, it's not it for housekeeping. Yeah, Thank you. Thank you to Anamanaguchi for the theme music, John Hughes from the album Endless Fantasy. Um, I think that's it. That's that's the end of the show, right? Yeah. All I think right. That's it. Cool. Thanks thank for you joining so us. Mu- yeah, thank you so much for listening. As always, um, share the show with a friend. Maybe this week, please. We appreciate <laughs> it. Seriously, we, we, we would really appreciate that. Uh, and we will see you next week. See ya. Bye. I'll throw a link in there for XCOM, by the way. Oh, yeah. Well, Shane's last fig. <laughs> well, oh, <laughs> sorry. I mistyped. <laughs> oh, no, it's the fucking age count. Shen curses the fig tree. <laughs> and it never grows figs again. I'll just do the link to it on Steam.